Briefing an instrument approach is a task that you'll be doing on every IFR flight. Different general aviation pilots have different methods of doing a brief. Some will read through the approach plate like a book, going from left to right and top to bottom. Some will get all the frequencies and avionics set up before starting the brief. On this flight, we'll run through a brief in chronological order, from the beginning of the approach through the landing or missed approach. We'll complete items as we brief, treating the approach plate as a sort of checklist for the procedure. First things first, when should we start the brief? On a typical IFR flight, like this one into Brunswick, Maine in our Cessna 172, we'll be handed off to an approach or center controller who will issue our approach assignment. Right now, we're flying northeast bound over Portsmouth, New Hampshire, approaching the Kennebunk VOR along our route, talking to Boston Approach. We've already gotten the weather information at Brunswick from the AWOS, dialed into our COM2 on 134.87. Around this time, we'll get our handoff to Portland Approach on 119.75. When we contact them, we get our approach assignment. November 518 Foxtrot Tango, Portland Approach, expect ILS runway 1 right approach into Brunswick. This is our approach assignment. Let's treat the word expect like a magic word, letting us know that we could both brief the approach and set up our avionics. We won't always hear the magic word expect. Sometimes approach will ask us which approach we want, and then reply in the affirmative. Sometimes we can proactively request the approach before being told what to expect. In all cases, assuming approach agrees, we could treat this event as our cue to begin briefing. So we pull up the approach plate. As I mentioned, we'll brief this approach chronologically. We'll start by confirming that we're looking at the approach plate for the procedure we were told to expect, the ILS to one right at Brunswick Executive, and that the plate is current. The first thing we'll do on the procedure, which we in fact already did, was get the weather. That was on the AWOS at 134.87, so if we didn't get it before, now would be a good time. We'd make sure the weather is better than the ILS minimums, 263 foot ceilings and one half mile of visibility. We're talking to Portland Approach on 119.75. This is our final controller, which we know by finding this frequency in the approach control box. It applies to the area between 112 degrees and 292 degrees from the field where we're coming from. Let's look at our approach transitions next. The initial approach fix to the southwest is the Kennebunk VOR. This is where we're currently navigating to as our flight plan dictates, so it's a strong possibility we'll be assigned this transition. The VOR frequency is 117.1. If we didn't already have this in, let's do so now. And we're going to put it onto our NAV2, saving the NAV1 for the localizer frequency since this is an ILS approach, and we'll ID the station. Let's also set up our avionics for the approach and transition. Our flight plan has Brunswick as our destination, of course, so when we hit PROC and select Approach, it'll display procedures for that airport. We want the ILS 1 right, and we want the Kennebunk ENE transition. We have the option to load or activate the approach. We were told just to expect the approach. We're not cleared for it and we haven't been issued any other instructions. If we load the approach, our navigation won't change. If we activate it, it'll sequence us to our initial approach fix. Now in this specific case, where we're headed and the initial approach fix happen to be the same point, but that's not usually the case. Normally, don't activate the approach until you've been instructed to fly to a fix on it or get a vector. So we're headed to the Kennebunk VOR at 7,000 feet. Once we're cleared for the approach, we'll fly 080 degrees from the VOR and sequence to Bailey, the intermediate fix. We'll be able to drop down to 2,000 feet on that segment. The segment specifically prohibits a procedure turn, so we'll make a left turn inbound onto the approach course, which is 012 degrees, intercepting the localizer. The localizer frequency is 109.3, so we'll make sure we have that dialed into the NAV1 and IDENTED. We'll also set the OBS to the inbound course of 012. From Bailey, we'll descend to 1700, the glide slope intercept altitude. We'll pick up the glide slope from around Carmer. It's around that time we would expect approach to approve our frequency change to CTAF, which we can put into COM1 standby on 122.72. We would then descend on the approach to the decision altitude at 263 feet. If we can continue on the approach on a 3 degree glide slope down to the runway, we should be able to see the medium intensity approach lights, as well as the runway environment, to land on the 8,000 foot runway, one right, at a touchdown elevation of 63 feet. We'll expect to exit right of the runway into parking. 
If we don't gain sight of the runway at the decision altitude, we'll immediately execute a missed approach. A straight ahead climb to 600 feet, followed by a climbing right turn to a heading of 080 and 3000 feet. From there, we'll intercept the 185 radial from the Augusta VOR. This is a new VOR, so we'll want to dial that into our NAV2 standby and set the OBS to 185 if we're not actively using it to navigate at the moment. Some other items on the plate that don't fit into our chronological brief are the minimum safe altitudes. It's a bit tough to eyeball this one since the VORs are drawn out of position on the plate. Even though we're coming from the west, we're actually in this sector with an MSA of 2600. The dividing line coming from the Augusta VOR cuts a bit like this. Let's read the notes section. DME is required. We could substitute our GPS for that requirement. The VDP doesn't apply since we're flying the ILS approach. The rest of the notes deal with higher minimums if we're not using the local altimeter. Finally, let's discuss any unique risks on this approach. There's a parallel runway, one left, which is closed. It's very close to our runway, closer than parallel runways usually are at most larger airports, so we'll need to make extra sure we've identified one right prior to landing. So that's our brief. Ideally, this will be complete and any questions from your co-pilot, instructor, or examiner addressed prior to receiving clearance. In keeping with the spirit of Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, we did our brief while also setting up frequencies in avionics, but it wouldn't hurt to double check to make sure we've got all the right numbers in the box. Like I said, there are various ways of briefing approaches, like systematically working through each section of the plate like a book, or setting up frequencies first and then double checking during the brief, but this chronological style helps put your head in the game for what comes next in the progression and keeps you ahead of the airplane. If you like the style of these training videos, check out Flight Insight IFR Online Ground School. It's not just for student pilots, as even well-seasoned IFR pilots have come away from the course saying they know more than when they went in. Head on over to the site linked here and in the description to learn more.